Eric. Omar. You know, they released a movie recently, and do you know what it was called? I don't. So there is a Patrick Swayze movie, either from 1989 or 1990. Are you familiar with the name of it? Roadhouse. Roadhouse, thank you. And did you know they released Pack? Did you see the trailer for it? Now a remake of it starring Jake Gyllenhaal and Conor McGregor. You saw that? I did. Okay, thank you, Dr. Pack. Uh, Eric, this wouldn't surprise you, and I'm not saying it's curious, the timeline, but we did a deep dive into some Trex lore last episode where it was revealed in all seriousness he was a bouncer sometimes he had to crack some skulls and we try to figure out if he was a cooler if he was the person there to you know make sure everything just calmed down nothing escalated or he was the person when shit kicked off and they needed someone reliable to crack those skulls he was the person and i just find it weird eric that they did this remake at the exact same time you know, they they made it within like what a day and then released it just as we're sharing this Trex lore. Yeah. And we did find out he was a cooler. He and was cooler. He also shared with us that just because you are coming into a situation trying to cool things down doesn't mean that everyone else might consent to cooling down. And while the cooler isn't the one who typically cracks heads, yeah. he mentioned that sometimes and one time specifically, you do get someone trying to crack your head. And we learned perhaps the real reason why his pop culture knowledge hasn't been quite up to spec with what we'd anticipate from most normal participants in society. Yeah, well, what was an injury? And that's why someone said, I want to read some of the comments before we get into the topic today. Just a few quick ones, because some people seem to enjoy, uh, you know, learning more Trex lore. Someone said, I have to assume that before beer mode, because Trex said he was 200 pounds, so he's complete bear mode, uh, tosses you out of a bar. He advises you on the benefits of meditation and mindfulness, but he'll actually pick you up and throw you out on the door right after that, which that that that's kind of how I was picturing it personally, Eric. I don't know about you. Yeah, no, I could see uh, enlightenment. And then at that body weight, you are going to be light enough for him to get enlightened right out the door. Um, but he will probably say something very kind and acknowledge your spirit as a, as a fellow human and that this suffering is just a, a necessary point in your growth. And when you m remember that after that alcohol induced memory lapse and hangover goes away, you're going to be like, you know what? I learned something from getting yeah. thrown out of that bar by Trexler. Yeah. But it would be so distant. You can't even remember what you'll be. You, you, you remember that you learned something. Um, a few, uh, more quick ones. Someone said, we need a Trex nation yawn compilation. But kind of the topic today that you can't please everyone, but you can definitely please yourself. Um, someone said, there are two not conflicting uh, comments. Someone said, wasn't a huge fan of the powerlifting recap, but was very invested in the Trex law, I assume lore, extended intro. And then someone else said, uh, five stars for the bouncer history, five stars for the powerlifting recap and analysis of incentive structures, four stars for the actual topic. So one person enjoyed it, one person not so much. How do you feel about that, Eric? <laughs> um, Don't think too as hard. You know, is, Don't go too deep. Uh, no, that, that's not impossible. <laughs> as you know, the only way for me to be happy is when I do please everyone, which is why I'm perpetually sad and trying to please others. And any time I do something where I find out I have not pleased others, I take that as a sign that I'm actually a terrible human. So it's a good life over here is all I have to say about that. Hey, someone came up. Did we coin it during the episode? And then I want to kick it over to Dr. Pack uh, to talk because there are two topics today. Did we mention Helm's Haven in the episode or did someone just propose that? So there's Trextopia and someone said hashtag Helm's Haven, which I'm going to be honest. I like that. I like Helm's Haven. Anything with alliteration, knowing that I'm one of the corniest people alive uh <laughs> i'm a big fan of um i think that fits perfectly with the meaning of lift um but no that is a new one we didn't mention it okay uh with the, only, the sure. only one that that has previously been uh, my my ha my hashtags has been helms deep helms which deep. been unfortunately sometimes either used adult career or, yeah yeah that one less appropriate the other one is oh we're gonna go helms deep on this topic other oh. ones are you know less savory 
Yeah, there was that spinoff of Lord of the Rings there in that back end starring yes, Noble Vegas. Yes. I remember. Yeah, Helm's yeah. Deep. Okay. So we have, hey, Dr. Pack, this is now, speaking of trilogies like Lord of the Rings, this is your third time on Iron Culture. First time you're very excited. Second time we're there together in person in Toronto, sipping on our espressos, talking on various things. Third time now, you just seem like you're over. What's going on, man? Hello, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Third time, I just did the Iron Culture gang sign. I'm not sure if you saw, for those of you watching, I, I see. I, yep. Re I see representing. And yes, free the guys. But yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited and I'm super excited for um, the next time I visit Toronto and I appear on Iron Culture for the 30th time. Nice. Yeah. And and that's, it's it's partially because we value you as a guest. It's also then because we're running out of topics. So the two working harmoniously, that's what we're about. There are two topics today, though, and I basically want to give Dr. Pack, who I do consider now a good friend. We first are really communicating now just over a year ago. But Pack, I want you to give a recap of the Arnold, because the reason I mentioned this, it's iron culture, it's history, science, culture. Um, something happened at the Arnold, we're at the Rascal booth, but to say that Dr. Pack played a pivotal role would be an understatement because he allowed the Rascal booth to do something no one has done, which is get the last living Titan, the Greek Titan, the last Hellenic God himself, Kyriakos Grizzly, to America for the first time ever. Folks, let me just tell you, I'll explain a little bit about the logistics, but I want to hear this from Pac, and I do want to just publicly give that recognition before my YouTube video interview featuring Dr. Pac and Grizzly comes out in 2027. Um, that you are, to say you're instrumental is an understatement. And I just, my friend, want to give you nothing but respect because you made it into a true spectacle by having Grizzly there, but also making him very comfortable. Keep in mind, as you described him, he's in a more remote part of Greece, um, you know, he's like 49 years old, him traveling. Like he's not, he's not your average influencer where he goes to expos every single year that he collabs with other people logistically, as we said, a pack, you know, getting him from Greece to the UK, UK, then to Ohio, just think about the plane seats. Uh, you know, he had his traveling companion, just again, the logistical setup, organizing everything, um, in order to make it happen. And it would not have been possible without Pac. So I do want to open up this episode. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the Arnold. We're going to talk about Grizzly and yourself. And then we're going to talk about memes and also uh, being a science communicator in 2024. But Pac, my friend, I just want to give you that respect. Thank you. And I want to give the respect back to you and Rascal and all of its uh, subsidiaries across the world, including Azerbaijan. Rascal Kabul, Rascal Azerbaijan, Rascal uh, Mongolia, and of course, Rascal Greece. But in all seriousness, uh, Rascal did make it possible for Grizzly to have a companion with him and two seats on literally every flight, which then Rascal Southampton had to arrange with the airlines. And the airlines were so, honestly, they were so accommodating because the we had booked the front row seats for Grizzly for extra leg room, but those seats have uh, a fixed uh, sort of um, arm uh, that, you, that you can move. And when the, the the people at the gate saw Grizzly, they were like, we'll give you other seats so you can actually utilize both seats. And that was amazing. But in all seriousness, yes, it was it was a trip, to say the least. Uh, Grizzly is somebody who doesn't, like, I'll give you a very brief backstory. Grizzly is somebody who was a bouncer slash bodyguard for many years. He lives and comes from the town of Kavala in northern Greece. That's a two-hour drive from Thessaloniki. Thessaloniki is the, like, one of the biggest uh, cities of Greece. And he rarely moves from his hometown. He's traveled abroad, I think, two times in the past because he was a competitive Olympic weightlifter. He had actually flown to a competition in Austria and one in Bulgaria. And this was the biggest trip of his life, both, uh, I, I assume, in terms of significance, but also in terms of length. So he had to travel from Thessaloniki, four-hour flight to London, um, then from London to Southampton by car, sleep for one night at a, at a hotel that we booked for him, and then the next day fly for approximately 12 hours to Columbus, Ohio, and so on and so forth. So huge trip for him. And keep in mind, the guy weighs 440 pounds on the dot and is 
it, like walking is a bit of a chore, especially when you have to move fast between flights and so on and so forth. And but he made it happen, and I'm very proud of him. No, Eric, Pack made it happen because Pack. Let me let me ask you a question, okay? How busy was the Rascal booth? A little bit of self promotion. I mean, like with 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 Grizzly. I mean, with so now that he so the man himself, the man, the myth, the legend has showed up. You have. Uh, various people, you know, legends in their own right. Jay Cutler, you have Ronnie Coleman there. Arnold, you know, he, he quick, quickly always, every Saturday, he'll just pass by. That's kind of what he does. But you have also like Mitchell Hooper who stopped by the booth. Like just like some very notable names or let's say uh, notable like YouTubers, social media uh, people like Sam Sulik uh, was there. He had his hostile uh, line, I think. But what happened with Grizzly then? Yeah, the line was 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 pretty significant, and the amount of um, not noteworthy, obviously, like respect to everybody that showed up, but you know the fact that Ed Cohen came specifically to shake Grizzly's hand. Even Grizzly was shocked, and he Grizzly, being a man who has stayed in his hometown for the majority of his time, I mean, he knows that people know of him, but when you come from a a small community, especially in Greece, everybody knows everyone, anyways. So. The guy works at a factory, you know, goes out. People know him because he's lived there his whole life. So when he started traveling and people started recognizing him at airports in uh, Greece, then in the UK, then in the in the US, uh, and then we went in the expo and he saw how much love and appreciation there was because people were people were much more respectful than I, than I anticip uh, anticipated. Obviously, I didn't expect people to be rude, but I thought they would lean into the meme a bit too much. But people came and they were. Legitimately excited to meet him, shake his hand. He he was insanely happy to do so. And even though it was tiring for him, I remember at the end he was like, "Wow, it's it's crazy that it's actually ending now. This was a, an amazing experience." But the Rascal booth was definitely popping, and it was a it was a very fun time, very well organized. And what was funny though, and allow me to throw some shade on my fellow Americans, is like, you guys have guns there, okay? Fair enough, whatever. Then you need. 10,000 times the police presence to guard from the guns. Fair enough. But then there was no security check whatsoever. I was entering the expo from the loading docks every <laughs> day with a minimum of five people with me with zero checks happening. So, but joking aside, the expo was very well, very well run. Everybody was super chill and it was easy to navigate. So shout out Arnold. Eric, I want you to interject here because there's a few more things to discuss about this, the grizzly phenomenon. I, I saw you uh, raise a concerning... I have questions. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, um, I just think this is a really interesting cultural phenomenon because memes have been a part of the internet since pre-social media. They were kind of the, the start of the internet culture, right? Where you could be like, yeah, I get that. It doesn't matter where I live. If I've been kind of on the internet, these things kind of coalesce. And some memes have life because it is something that we all relate to and others are based upon people. Sometimes it is truly just derision and we don't like them or it's just funny, you know, like the, the aliens guy, you know, with his hair being crazy and it's like, oh, it shows this. And I think people would be really remiss and incorrect if they thought that's what Kyriakos Grizzly was. And I... I'm not actually surprised that he was given that respect, that he wasn't treated like a circus act. I'm really glad to hear he wasn't, but it doesn't surprise me because I think something that makes the, the meme mean a little more than just like the aliens guy meme for, for Grizzly is that, and it's funny you brought up Sam Sulek, is that in some of these people who really catch hold in the lifting community is you get a true sense that they are embedded and like they love lifting. It is part of who they are. It is how they express themselves and that they are actually a, a part of the, a part of the culture and community. And yeah, there are, are potentially funny things about them or even ridiculous things about them or some things that, you know, happen to, to, to generate the meme side of it. And while I think those more memeable aspects are what get someone out there in the public eye. I think what keeps them there and that makes it that that's deeper than that is that view of that connection. And I think it's really obvious if you watch any video of Grizzly, like you might be confused, like what is he lifting? Why is he doing it? What is going on? And like the curiosity in you and maybe even the judgmental attitude in you is pinged. And that that's enough right there to make a meme, right? Being judgmental, it being funny and being curious and confused. 
Like the, that milieu of emotions is going to, is going to make a meme, right? But the thing that's undeniable as well is whatever this man is doing, he is about it, you know, and it means something to him. There's emotion behind it. There's, there's history behind it. There's, he's in a, an Olympic weightlifting gym. If you look around him where people come and train, they're probably not putting their shit on Instagram. Those are, you know, Alico plates that were probably purchased sometime in 1997. You know, and, and there are probably some people in there who have done some amazing things that are never even been recorded, um, that are just living the lifter's life. And for anyone who's been in that environment or had those experiences, I think there's a, an, a connection you can see there. And again, like it, it's kind of maybe part of the reason why the Sam Sulik phenomenon and other things like that are, are taking hold. So it's obviously very different, but yeah, I just wanted to, so anyway, that's my observation. And my question is, is because Kyriakos Grizzly has, I've had that same curious, you know, uh, thoughts about him is I am intensely curious about what is his lifting background like? Are there old competition videos of him snatching and clean and jerking international competition as, a, as, as an Olympic weightlifter? And are we ever going to get to see these? Like, I want to see, I, I want to know more about the, uh, the, the man behind the myth. Yeah. So I'll give you, because I know most of his story, I'll give you a, a, a quick rundown. He is somebody who started lifting at around 12 years old and started first as a kickboxer. And he was, he then transitioned to Olympic weightlifting and even trained with some of the, the greatest uh, Olympic weightlifters to come out of Greece, um, more specifically Kaki Kakiasvili. If, if you know, he was um, close with Pyrrhus Dimas as well at the time. He did train with a national team of Greece, and he has competed internationally. I will quote some numbers now as far as uh, snatch and clean and jerk um, competition results. Take them with a grain of salt. Somewhere in the 180 uh, kilo range for snatch, somewhere in the 220 for clean and jerk. Is that is that too much? I think that's too much, right? Ooh, they're really, they're, I mean, they're I, really high. He would be his weight class would be what uh, unlimited. He was, one five plus. Yeah, it was unlimited. But it may be, what? it may be that it may be that it was actually one sixty and two hundred. I think two twenty, which is good. But that's very, that's very good. Yeah. Do we know the the the, the specific era of when he was lifting? It was so he was born in 1974. And he was therefore lifting in the early 90s. So when he was in his early 20s. Um, but there's no, there are some pictures. He did mention that there is some VHS tape somewhere. Mm -hmm. But he was a competitive weightlifter. Let's even disregard the numbers, right? He has he has told me that he, he front squatted, you know, near 300 kilos and back squatted. I can believe it. That I can believe for sure. And he has sustained multiple injuries throughout the years, uh, which I also remember by heart. He has torn he, both his biceps, his tricep, his quad, and he has all sorts of connective tissue damage from, from, from lifting. He was an Olympic weightlifter and then an and somebody who also liked martial arts a lot. And he worked as a bodyguard and a bouncer for his whole life. Let me just say this. Grizzly is as legit as they come. Ain't nobody messing with Grizzly. And if you see him spar with some elite level pro kick, kickboxer. kickboxers, yeah, we're talking, we're talking, taking kicks to the to his uh, elbows, uh, to his uh, sorry forearms without any protection from professional kickboxers and sparring and being able to to go uh, not to, to to keep up with them. And also, if you know anything about boxing and you see Grizzly shadow box for a man at two hundred kilos, he is he is solid. Anywho. He sustained multiple injuries, and but he was a guy that always enjoyed taking things to the max. Yes, and and for him that was max load. He was like he considers strength to be more fluid than some of our definitions. Where whenever we say strength and we think of lifting weights, we immediately think squat, bench, deadlift, maybe overhead press, and a couple of more uh, barbell variations. But for Grizzly, it was like okay, strength is more fluid, but also he likes to view strength in a dynamic and in an absolute sense. And it's like, what's the most weight I can hold in my hands, even if that means lifting it off blocks and holding it for three cent for, you know, uh, uh, above the blocks, uh, uh, three centimeters above the blocks. So he has kept training and back a lot of the videos that you see on YouTube are recycled videos. They're not necessarily 
fresh because you know the guy is 50 years old and he can't he doesn't want to risk snapping more of his uh, stuff up but back in his um back in his prime at least as an unconventional lifter a lot of the lifts that he did he did out of necessity because he had to work around like he couldn't clean and jerk or deadlift or do a bench press but if you if you know you know like muscle snatching 130 kilos easy mm-hmm. easy for reps or upright rowing um, he did upright rowing 140 for 16 reps or curling um, that's the big one that's the big one because he he was yeah. like i want to beat siplenkov Le- and he and levon bro did, he'd be both and levon as well yeah and bro like i am i consider myself for, for general strength standards a strong guy i can strict press 220 i can deadlift 635 you know, I can row 220 for, for, for reps with a strict form, and I weigh 240. And next to Grizzly, I look like in that gym that day, I was the thin guy. I was the, the fitness model guy. And as far as like absolute strength goes, uh, it's once you meet the guy and you, you hold his hand, you're like, oh, okay, it's real. And if you try any of the unorthodox lifts, which we also saw Brian Shaw try, we saw a bunch of super strong people, and you can make the argument that, hey, you know they hadn't learned those lifts, but the numbers were very far from what Grizzly could do in his uh, in his prime. But uh, he was curling uh, 140 kilos, obviously with yes. the use of some external momentum, but for six reps with reps in the tank, yes. curling 315 yeah. for reps. I I don't think I could do 180 <clears throat> with with uh, with momentum. I'm not sure about you guys because you yeah. both are pretty strong yeah. as well, especially you, Omar. Uh, but but Pat, one thing I was going to say, a guy, just to put it in context, because Eric asked about the Olympic weightlifting, I think his ladder achievements are quite frankly more impressive. You just said, so we're talking two arm wrestling world champions, Dan Saplinkov, Levon. There's videos of them and they both curled 140 kgs. Just compare their video and Levon, it's unlimited body weight once again. So Levon can weigh whatever he wants, right? And Grizzly, same idea. Compare and Grizzly did one more repetition and look, compare their technique, and you can actually argue that Grizzly used better, or like, let's say, less momentum. And so that in and of itself is highly impressive. And there's a reason why this is what I wanted to mention. I'm glad you brought up Brian Shaw. I think, Eric, one of the appeals for uh, someone like Grizzly, uh, for people on the outside, he's really an in-the-know person, meaning every single top-tier strength athlete that had to give commentary about Grizzly immediately gave him respect. Not like meme respect, like, oh, this is a big guy, whatever. Like uh, Eddie Hall, he did a reaction video. Uh, Brian Shaw, where they're they're actually overviewing, they're taking a look, okay, what's this guy doing? Well, how, is it, how much weight is this? Wait a second. And they immediately know, being really big lads themselves, hoisting a lot of weight, that this is no nonsense strength. Grizzly's obviously limited now by those various injuries. But there is the appeal, I feel, exactly what you said, Eric, about being a person of the people, but being about it. And what I mean when I say that, we had a video with him for Rascal, and there's the Grizzly fandom that now has developed. I mean, guys like like PewDiePie, one of the biggest YouTubers, made a video about Grizzly because he is, to your point, kind of perplexing. At first, you kind of laugh, or you're like, okay, here's this big dude. He's like doing these ways. Like, why is he doing this? Why is he screaming? It's confusing. But that's why I said he's kind of a meme in the know, where if you know what you're talking about, if you know what to look for, it's actually highly respectable the things he's done. But it's also the sacrifice he's given in order to achieve that, the whole idea of full, right, his body weight. You have to live it, the same idea, where like that embodiment, that quote, where what you said, Pac, he wants to go to the max. We had that video with him, whatever, one of the Arnold recaps, cool. And within the Grizzly fandom is very well received. But then you immediately see he got 4 million views on Instagram and then on his own YouTube, it got like 2 or 3 million. So obviously not everyone's aware of Grizzly. But look at the commentary of the people that know who Grizzly is and people who don't know who Grizzly is. And I'll just say, he, he I can only assume, due to his body weight and many other things, not that he's faced ridicule, but the judgment and stigma by outsiders, I think is part of the appeal of the meme status because people in the know, therefore, want to defend him. It's like his, it's his right to his own autonomy, to himself, his choice he wants to make, where he wants to be as large as possible. He wants to, you know, push as much weight. And so he's, he's really, he's a hero to fitness enthusiasts with that, you know, phrase, you have to live it because he's the embodiment of it to an extreme level and a level that most of us will not go through tearing so many muscles, 
you know, spending the vast majority of his life, he's 50 years old. A lot of people giving some commentary, they're in their 20s, right? They have, they've lived less than Grizzly has dedicated towards the gym. So he is this living embodiment of this idea of pushing oneself. Go ahead, Pac. Yeah. Um, the, and, uh, just yeah. for a little bit more context, I know a lot of our lift, uh, a lot of our listeners are powerlifters or bodybuilders. They don't really know what are good Olympic weightlifting numbers. Um, but the weight classes have changed a lot in weightlifting even more frequently than IPF. So in the, I, I want to say 92 to 97, um, assuming he was our, always a pretty big guy, I could be wrong. Sure, was, yeah, it's not okay. Actually. He would have been in the 108 uh, plus category. And if he was competing from 98 until, I want to say it was 2018 when they changed it from 105 plus to now, I think it's 109 plus. Um, so yeah, the Greek national records, uh, if you look at the historical records in the 105 plus category, they were set, uh, in the late nineties and mid two thousands by Oleg Paratidis and Dimitrios Papagiridis. And I'm apologies back if I didn't pronounce this right. We're looking at a 195 snatch, 232 clean and jerk and a 426 total. So being in the 105 plus or the 108 plus and doing a 180 uh, 200 kind of ish total, or even did you say 220 or 180? 200? Yeah, I, don't rem- I don't remember exactly. Something along those lines, though. Something impressive. Yeah. Those would probably put him on the podium at Greek Nationals, potentially, you know, winning some years. Um, and uh, I don't, I don't have the 97 and earlier records. Um, but even if it was 160, 180, like those are, those are very good numbers, even for a super. And though that that would put you at like the uh, like an international grade, like maybe an A grade, uh, if it goes like a, a lead international, international, then like A B C. Um, so that th- those are, those are very good lifts, regardless of body weight. If he was to do like one sixty, one eighty, or one sixty two hundred, um, so yeah, no, those are that's those are like very very legitimate lifts. They're extremely skilled lifts, and as someone who's you know been involved in Olympic weightlifting a fair bit for a good part of my career and competed in it. Um, yeah, that, does, that doesn't just happen. And it doesn't surprise me at all that someone who can, I mean, if you look at him, like his video of doing strict curl, not strict curls, so of him doing like six curls with 140, um, remembering that a snatch or a clean or a clean and jerk, you're using the most efficient full body motion to move weight as far as you can. Like if he can curl 140 now, like, he probably could have power cleaned 180 then, <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? So it's, I think it's just, uh, that, 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 that wouldn't surprise me at all. Like, like, even though people are like, oh, but he's using all this like cheaty technique and these weird lifts. I'm like, yeah, but someone who can throw around 140 like that, guarantee you he, he was, he was cleaning, uh, substantially more than that. Like I, I would be surprised if he couldn't, if he, if he couldn't have cleaned 180 back in the day. Nearly, go, nearly four hundred pounds go. for Red Bull. Back, yeah. Please go, Eric. What were your uh, best best numbers as a powerlifter, and at, were they at the, as a ninety three kilo lifter or an eighty three? Because I remember you had done a cut, right? Was it two twenty seven, yeah. one fifty, two sixty five? Yeah, my best numbers ever. If we just look at individual lifts, were like this. If we talk about absolute numbers, my best squat is two twenty seven and a half, uh, and I did that at home because we had COVID lockdown three days before New Zealand nationals. Uh, my best. Pause bench is 155 at 93, and my best deadlift is 260 at 93. And I've done basically 10% less than that at 83. Yeah, so like all those all those lifts, and if, uh, if I were to calculate the total and compare to all the power lifters in the world, that would put you uh, in the 85th percentile. And yeah. I'd say, because obviously Omar, Omar and I don't have competitive experience, but you know, a, a, a truly legit power lifter. And I would very much doubt that you can even come near, myself included, right? But I just wanted to put it in perspective that you'd come even near some of these unorthodox lifts on the curls, lateral raises, upright rows as grizzly, even if you were to gain a bunch of body weight. Yeah. Actually, you know, I've got a, I've got a good friend of mine um, who's a two time Commonwealth silver, silver medalist, uh, Stas Chaleev. He's, uh, he was my coach during Olympic weightlifting during my comeback. And, um, he's been involved with North sport Olympic weightlifting for a long time. Um, and he is someone who is one of the most skilled, efficient lifters because his absolute strength isn't crazy. Um, so he, when he, he was a one Oh five, 
um, and I was a 93 and he had a, like a high bar squat of around 220 and I was having a low bar squat of 227. So like our strength for body weight and different techniques is relatively comparable. Um, I think he totaled 600 in a 105, uh, meet as a power lifter that he just tried one time, pulled sumo. So he's, he's strong, but he's not crazy strong, but he's incredibly efficient. So Stas Tuleyev, he's done, um, like close to 190 clean and jerk. And he's, he's t- done like, I think 155, 188 are probably his best numbers at 105 and under. And considering that he's, he's only squatting like two, I think it's 230 is his best squat, but a clean and jerk of 188. That can help people understand that an incredibly good and powerful Olympic weightlifter who is at maybe the 80th percentile or 85th percentage percentile of powerlifting can do those types of numbers. So you think about that, that's someone who's incredibly efficient. I don't think the numbers that, that we, we are postulating from Grizzly are at all unreasonable. I, I Like, obviously, I don't have video footage, but I think that it can just help people put things in. Like, if you convert, and, and if you take a less efficient um, lifter, someone who is doing those same numbers but has a higher strength reserve, they're probably closer to like a 700 total. So, Eric, like, I, if you're I, totaling 400 Olympic weightlifting, you're probably totaling 800 in powerlifting. Gents, or more. I think we just got to frame it this way once again so people can truly understand what a freak Malord is. No one else is curling 140 kg for six repetitions. No. So he's a one of one. It, in my personal opinion, not that it doesn't matter what he was doing in weightlifting, but he's known for his ladder achievements. It gives him credibility. But even if yep. that's all he ever did was be a weightlifter, he'd be a respectable weightlifter. It's that he's gone to a place no one else has where he's been a certain body weight. There's a fluidity to Pax point where I'd encourage people to watch. He did 10 burpees in like 40s at 200 kgs. He's bunny hopping at 200 kgs. So my man is moving and then he's curling once again more. And I'm going to restate this curling more than world champion arm wrestlers, where this is one of the movements that they train for. And LaVon, because it's an unlimited weight category, LaVon weighs almost 400 pounds. So he could weigh as much as he want, wants. And so Grizzly, at one of the core movements that they train, Grizzly's doing it better than the world champions at that discipline. I think that alone, that that to me is kind of like the, the introductory part where it gives Grizzly immediate respect for people that don't know anything about anything whatsoever. You know what I mean? Yeah, and things like he has a Zercher squat up to death, like maybe parallel, maybe not as to grass, of 250 kilos. Like Zercher holding the bar in Zercher squat, because like it's close to a front squat, 250 kilo Zercher squat with ease as well, maybe with a rep or two in reserve. Yeah, that's very, like, and that's very comparable to front squatting strength. And that's huge. That's insane. Yeah. So just to get back to it, uh, Pat, because I want to give uh, some final respect to you and to Grizzly before we get to the second topic then about themes and science communication. Uh, I have a, a few more points to go over with it, but I want to make sure you cover everything you want, either about the trip or about you interacting with Grizzly, just yourself, like kind of, you know, your journey pack uh, as someone who participated in the memes, enjoyed it, and then seeing the living embodiment in person in Ohio out of all places where we joke, like we did say that I had my man, uh, Nigel, doing the, uh, he was the announcer for our booth. And he said, this is likely, and we we state that to you know, not be uh, too definitive. The only time you will see Grizzly in the United States, I'm like, this is never going to happen again. And I do think, Eric, people brought this proper level of respect because the meme Good. gets you in, but then the story makes you respect him. And I actually was, I, I, I was surprised myself, Pac. That's why Pac had his whole crew roll up. We had a great squad of the Rascal. But just to be aware, you know what I mean? Because Grizzy, when you when you invite memes, you invite a certain category potentially of people. But it was, I was honestly saying like wholesome. Wasn't there a kid, uh, Pac, where like uh, the kid was a cra- like, the kid was super nervous. He was a cry. The, the parents were there. Like you you translated basically all of it. But there were some, there were some <laughs> genuinely tender moments. There were. There were people coming saying, I, I, I love you. And like... They were a bit too starstruck. And I was like, okay, <laughs> yeah, guys, like um, okay, you know, meeting, you know, the president of, I don't know if you would say, I love you to the president. But uh, the best question was, are you a translator by trade? And I was like, <laughs> I'm not, but uh, great ego check. Brushed trip. it. 
Yeah. But it was it was fun, bro. Look, as somebody who used to watch Grizzly back in 2013 when you had 300 views and people from Greece knew Grizzly, not just from the lift, but also from the street cred. And we mm -hmm. even, like we had heard stories of like people getting multiple people getting knocked out and, um, you know, all part of the job, track lore uh, style. <laughs> And uh, yeah, like cool going to Ohio with some of those very close friends. Like it, it's as meta as it gets. It was like a matrix glitch. Ohio with Omar Isuf, uh, Kiryakos Grizzly, and existing there because Ohio, like Columbus itself, was it's just like it's not a place where you're like, oh yeah, yeah we're gonna travel to the states for the first time in our lives. Let's go to Columbus. <laughs> Shout out to Columbus, but it's it's yeah. like going to Greece and going to you know mid you know some random city in Greece and be like, yeah, it's. Anyways, too many disclaimers. It was great. I loved it. And it memories of a lifetime. And I appreciate Rascal and all its subsidiaries for making it happen. And yeah, no. buy the damn hey. shirts. Hey. The best part that I can say is that we had a tentative date for the Iron Culture documentary, also funded by Rascal, coming out. I think we decided 2026, Omar, we thought it was a, a stretch goal. 2020 never. Yeah, it's very close to that. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the beauty of this is it's only going to delay at something very reasonable because, you know, you know, Grizzly's taking precedence. So now we're looking at just some time in the early 2030s for the Iron Culture documentary. So, yeah, it's good news. It's like Francis yeah. Ford Coppola with his Megapolis, uh, his film. When is it going to be released? Soon is the word, right? Mm -hmm. Soon right. soon just kind of encapsulates everything. In your everything. lifetime. Yeah. Um, what I would say just to, uh, close it off, because I do want to make sure I give that respect because will we ever do the Arnold again? I don't know, a pack, but you made it possible. Uh, you're very, I would say like selfless because there were so many phone calls, uh, not just with me, but with, uh, Grizzly to make it happen. This man never asked for anything. Like I, I do have just the highest respect and I want to make sure it's put out just in case that YouTube video it takes forever in the proper respect. I've been MIA on my social media, so I'm not posting about it on Instagram. I go on our culture every single week. So I want to give you, man, the utmost respect. And then also, Eric, speaking of the documentary, the Rascals for making everything possible to fund all these things, all these uh, projects, right? Because without them, none of this would be possible. And it's been consistent support over a decade. Also with the channel, it was heartwarming. You had the booth, like people came up to pack, like the amount of conversations, familiar faces, old faces, new faces, um, that they all really made it happen uh, in order to have that booth, have that opportunity. Uh, and then for pack. Uh, once again, uh, just to massage it and make it fluid, being the translator on the fly, properly translating everything to, I see it, Eric, I see that shirt. Uh, what an experience. So, and then we, we brought the Grizzly uh, there and he was able finally to tell his story. And if, you know, we went as examples to Ireland for the Irish Lifting Stones, which is a very, very powerful with Dr. Connor Heffernan. Uh, participating in the culture is one of the true privileges. So I do view this as a moment um, and that we'll all look back on uh, fondly. So I, I want to wrap that part up by just saying that. Back. 100%. Just a little fun story. When um, Omar took us to an amazing restaurant, actually one of the best restaurants I've been to, no joke, no hyperbole, had one of the best steaks I've had in my life and one of the best oatmeal cream pies ever. Honestly, no joking. Um, at the end, uh, we, we took like a group picture in the back of the, the restaurant where they had like a winery sort of setup, like a proper like a, a wine factory sort of setup. And Grizzly, as everybody was leaving, including the, including the Olivares brothers, spots an industrial scale, <laughs> calls me, call them, call them to, to come back, to weigh themselves. I then have to go to two people that obviously, look, I don't know. And these guys are athletes, right? Okay, sure, they're heavy, but these are athletes that yeah, I met a couple of times. Hi, my name is Pat. They probably don't remember my name. And I'm like, guys, can you uh, come and... Uh, weigh yourselves with Grizzly. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's like Grizzly's pointing at the scale and instructing them to go one by one on the scale. And you could see you could see in their faces, they were like, okay, we're being weighed now, everybody with their phones out taking videos. Grizzly's super excited to weigh. And uh, <laughs> yeah. then Grizzly uh, also complained that he the steak was uh, had too many sauces. Grizzly's uh, food taste is a bit questionable. Uh, it was mostly true. <laughs> Mostly triple cheeseburgers from McDonald's and the breakfast at the hotel that he ate, but uh, it had too many sauces. Shout out to really though. Super, super nice guy. There's a cost to the game of being 200 kilos and not being, you know, necessarily in the mainstream food culture to get there because 
Some of us will never be 200 kilos. It doesn't matter what I would try to do, what anabolics I took, uh, whether or not you got me a wheelchair to reduce my energy expenditure even more and connected me to an IV, could never do it. So you know what? You take some hits. It reminds me of the time that I was with the 105 kilo 2018 world champ move, going from uh, world champs, Bryce Lewis, over to the EPC. And we missed one of our connecting flights because we would have needed to run to get it. And Bryce looked at me and said, can't do it. And I said, you know what? This, this, is, this, 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 this is the price of being a world champion. And I will wait four hours in this airport with you and we'll redirect our flights. It is what it is. My friend shook his hand, gold medal. You're, you're five, six and you're the one Oh five kilo champ. Who cares? You know what? We're hanging out in the airport with your gold medal. Five, six is too tall. Yeah. Five, six pack is now too tall for one Oh five. As we know with the, the, the way class is the way, the way things are going. Shout out to Bryce though. I would do want to transition to the topic, but I saw my man speaking of Bryce Lewis is so nice to be reunited with, like I said, so many friendly faces familiar. Also, uh, Jessica Bidner was there. Jesus was there. So we had like some world champions at the booth. That's awesome. Or also the opportunity, Eric, which is unrelated, will eventually be released. But we had a video with Jesus where he was a stylist. We did that for Rascal. But where else can you get the intersection of making Jesus a stylist for a comedy skit? And then his subject that he's doing a fashion makeover for is going to be Austin Perkins. <laughs> and you get I, the line. Yeah. I don't know who. <laughs> Who makes all of the uh, the scripts? Unfortunately, and myself. The, uh, no, no, no. I do know. Yeah. I was I was gonna give you some love, <laughs> but the, uh, the, the 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 artistic genius uh, of Rascal cannot be downplayed. And I'm not just saying that out of a sense of guilt that I've probably stolen worth of maybe four thousand dollars worth of Rascal pair each time I hang out with you. Slow mount. No, it's, and, it's you it's, know. Uh, all I know is that I am motivating you out of a sense of financial scarcity because of the, the the theft that I do of your clothing to need to have good marketing to sell more, to offset the Helms cost because I haven't purchased clothes since I got involved in the fitness industry sometime in 20,000. And we're all eating, bro. They were all, we're all eating at the buffet. We call, and that's how... <laughs> like, and that's Helms deep, right? The financial debt. No, I was going to say, I like, I like how Helms <laughs> wants to be a bad boy so bad where I was like, we're at the warehouse. And I said, Eric, please take anything and he's like he looks around for 30 minutes because eric is very proper the word like scrum now like very proper or he picks one shirt and he said oh this is from like basically like it's uh it's extra stock of ours he picks that and i said no bro like go ahead and i had to tell him like a few times and every time he'd just like pay you like he'd look over and then he would ask one of the people shout out to drew that works at our fulfillment uh warehouse and then it, it, he's like oh are those those are elder so i could take those and he's just like picking it slowly i'm like right, just take the shit man like come on let's just like, like just take whatever you want so to say that as an exaggeration is an understatement. Moving forward, though, speaking about memes, speaking about the art of content creation, whether it be for marketing, whether it be for your own personal brand, Dr. Pack, Patrick Close, never insult your name, um, you had a post, and I thought it would be a great launching point for the second topic today, because we'll go for another 45 minutes, okay? We're just getting revved up. We're talking about memes, the living embodiment of a meme, uh, Grizzly, exposure, Eric, to a general audience. Um, Pac, you said something, and so I'm not going to recap the entire thing, but it is something notable because I will say, like, individuals such as yourself, uh, Milo Wolf, Dr. Uh, Milo Wolf, are now some of the new young guns in the space uh, trying to, you know, uh, the art of science communication, trying to communicate fitness information to a general audience. And I do think there needs to be more people in academia or more PhDs doing the damn thing. So it's very nice to see you guys uh, enter the foray, uh, the space, uh, so to speak, and try and uh, do this. You said, however, that you've been doing this now, what? Uh, your social media pack really trying, like on Instagram, would you say like two years? Like, wh what is that now? Just to give some context before I read the the quote. And YouTube, what, four months? Like, I just want to get the, the numbers right, man. Yeah, YouTube is four months on the four dot. Months. And I've been making an effort to, to put effort. out some form of educational content since uh, summer, not last summer. Yeah, one and a half years, approximately. Right, so one and a half years, right? Okay, and so... 
Personally, I will state my opinion uh, before reading this. I do think both of you do a tremendous job. And like I said, I think there just needs to be more people in the space because I think there are more participants than ever before, either as consumers, viewers, or then people creating content. And so having really good information conveyed in such a way that people can absorb it. Crucial. Okay. Uh, so you said, uh, I've seen a couple comments the past days along the lines of how can you be a researcher and make memes or that I should be more serious on IG given that I'm an academic. Although overall people don't seem to mind, allow me to note the following. So just to be clear, if you're not following Dr. Pack, follow him on Instagram. Kai uh, will link it in the description. But oftentimes you'll have a meme. They have, you don't need to do this. It is oftentimes there will be, uh, it'll be the information delivered in meme format. So way, once again, that is more digestible. If you're just a general observer, you can understand kind of the top level what's being communicated. And then there's usually like a paragraph or two of text down below explaining it further. And they seem to go over very well right? It's been a way that you use as a vehicle to communicate your thoughts. One, you said, just because I love science research, that doesn't mean I have to fit into the somewhat negative stereotype of the uptight and serious academic. Even though I don't always take myself too seriously, I take my work seriously, and that's all that should matter. I studied under the great James Steele, so it's unlikely I'll ever take academia and its formalities seriously. Lastly, who cares about being serious? We're freaks at Genova A. All 2015. And then the second part, I do want you to kick this off, uh, Pac, where you said, and this was the powerful part that I think people have to keep in mind, but I want you to really discuss this. Um, memes turn out to be a solid science communication tool. As an educator, one thing I've been somewhat vocal about is that education can be more fluid and flexible and open-ended than has traditionally been taught. Yes, they're memes, but does that really matter? If it helps communicate science in a fun and engaging way, I'm all for it. To quote my academic role model, AKA my mother, shout out to the senior. Uh, if we do not meet the learner where they are, how can we lead them where they need to go? Many people don't want to read research reviews or long form articles let alone full text of the actual papers. A meme plus caption allows us to communicate science and potentially spark further interest in science to those less inclined to read papers, while also facilitating discussion amongst those who will directly go to the source anyways. Also, chill, it's not that deep. I love what you said. I want you to uh, launch off from there. Helms, I know you're going to have some things to say, but talk to us, man. So four months now on YouTube, four months really in the game, communicating with both a general audience and then amongst your peers about a year and a half making memes on Instagram. Yeah. Go ahead. So I, just a bit of background, I come from a, a family of parts, partly academics. Uh, my mother is somebody who's been teaching in the International Baccalaureate as a both as a coordinator, um, as a teacher, and now a teacher of teachers, essentially. And my stepfather, the same. My stepfather was essentially the coordinator at the Athens College in Athens. He's British, and he's, he's taught all over the world, from Singapore to Dubai, to the UK. And, who's, and I, I grew up around academics and around people that taught and loved teaching. And I always remember, you know, my mother... Uh, having students, uh, alumni students, uh, reach out to her and, and keep in, in contact and always seeing students pass by the house. And when we lived in Germany and we lived inside the, the, the boarding school, um, you know, students, they had developed a deep connection with my mother as a as an educator. So I grew up around educators that, uh, you know, if if you know, you know, academia is not some some <laughs> a, a sport where you, you go for the money. Obviously, you know, you'll make a living at some stages, but we're not talking about anything crazy, especially when you're, you know, teaching even at the best private schools. And we're talking like elite private schools where my mother worked at the, the, the salaries are solid, but they're not, you know, a golden ticket by no means. And in order to be an educator at that level, I'm, I'm sure that doesn't apply to everyone, but to my mother and my, my stepfather did, they, they also were educators for the love of the sport. And I personally started lecturing at around 21 years old. I started teaching sport nutrition and strength and conditioning here at Solon University as an associate lecturer when uh, there was a, a position, a temporary position, when uh, there was a, one of my professors then was pregnant and she, she, she took some time off and they were like, hey, uh, would, you, would, you, would you cover? And I really enjoyed teaching. And what struck me though is that, okay, the goal here is to get information across, to engage students, get them to think critically and get them to actually buy into whatever I'm trying to teach rather than 
tre uh, treating teaching as a check as a tick box exercise where I'm like, okay, I showed up, I spoke, they they were there, they will do their assignment, I marked it, the end, which is something that you often unfortunately see in academia. That's a bigger, that's a rabbit hole about incentives and so on and so forth. Um, and that's a sort of mentality that I started to to have a discussion with in my head and with our other academics. Like, is the goal here to um, to adopt a certain stance and adopt a certain sort of more serious etiquette uh, that has been traditionally associated with academia? Or can we be a bit more unorthodox, a bit more fluid and potentially get students to engage more and get people to actually, you know, learn stuff versus just treating university and treating uh, the classes as a, as a class where you show up because you have to or because of your attendance, score needs to be whatever, and then you do the test or the assignment just to pass. That's, for me, that's that's not worth it. You might as well not, not do university, at least for the most part. And with memes specifically, it was obviously not something that I had initially planned, but being somebody who doesn't take themselves way too seriously and enjoying the humor side of things. I, I I happened to make a few memes and they they did well in quotation marks, you know, nothing, nothing crazy. And then I was like, hmm, maybe this is a good way to spark interest uh, in science, communicate some scientific findings and reach more people that wouldn't be necessarily reading full texts anyways, or doing any sort of deep dive. Now, obviously it's, it's difficult to communicate all the nuance, but I, I tried to do my best with the captions and so on and so forth. And just because they're memes and they're, you know, funny pictures or whatever, sketches, or they're not and you know, super serious. In this day and age, unfortunately, posting a paper or a long text screenshot, nobody's reading that. Nobody's is going to engage. And I was like, okay, if we're getting more people to engage by these memes and engage with science and have some sort of discussion, or even just leave with a few easy practical takeaways, why is that bad? Why do we need to adhere to this sort of stereotype of we are PhDs? And that's that's where the whole Dr. Pack and the real doctor comes into play. Like Dr. Pack is is cringe as a as a is somewhat cringe, you know, as a as a as a brand name, but obviously my name is Patrick Sandra Likes Parakis. But at the same time, that's the whole joke of you know, real doctors and so on and so forth. Like we must not like taking ourselves way too seriously in academia and gatekeeping a bit and being in our ivory tower and just posting the, the screenshot of the latest paper where nobody reads it and nobody cares. I don't think that that's doing much from an education standpoint. Obviously, some people fight the good fight inside classrooms and at universities, and I'm all for it. But, you know, memes turned out to, to work well. So why not? The same way, you know, something else may, may work great. It might be a bit unorthodox. It might not adhere to certain, you know, formalities. But if it does the job, isn't that what we care about at the end of the day? I have so many thoughts on this. Um, and this has been something, what you're talking about, that has been a a topic for probably uh, popularly since the early 90s. Um, this push and pull of traditional academia and science and education versus educating society in ways that will actually be effective. Um, and how is seemingly altruistic, positive, and pretty straightforward you think that would be, and in line with the goal, ostensibly, of academia, there's actually been a cost to trying to be a science communicator. And I think those costs have amplified and they've gotten less clear. And there has been, obviously, a mistrust in science as of late because of cultural changes. Um, disinformation, the social media age, uh, and the politiza politicization of science and information, um, as well as, you know, true information wars and fake news and, and the death of the expert. There's so much that goes into this. And I think it's important briefly to discuss some of the history of this and how science communicators have struggled with this for a long time. Um, I mean, you can go all the way back to like, Galileo Copernicus and, and some of the, you know, persecution once something becomes seen as like, once it exits maybe the, the stuffy academic hall and it gets in front of the king or the church, uh, you know, you're, you're at risk if it doesn't necessarily 
confine itself to what the orthodoxy is telling you. And we know those kind of historical messages, but in more contemporary times, for those who are a little young, you may not be familiar with this person, but Carl Sagan, as someone who's turning 41 next month, is actually who I grew up with as a, as a, as a child and as a young man, as the first science communicator, and also Stephen Hawking. And then in my adult life, Neil deGrasse Tyson. And these are people who are almost always astrophysicists because they are, they, they're seen at the, the tippity top of kind of like the, the smart person of, of, of society. Like this is, most people physically don't have the, the, the neurobiology to even complete a PhD in, or let alone a bachelor's degree, to be honest. Like, I don't, I don't think I could get a degree in astrophysics. It's just not where my, my, my talents lie. And, um, Carl Sagan was the person who originally narrated the series called Cosmos um, that talks about the origins and, and the history of the world and the formation of life and the formation of the universe itself and was a very well-known popular science communicator through the 70s, 80s, and 90s. He wrote um, nonfiction, kind of science fiction speculation books. He appeared on interviews. He was incredibly visible in media. And in 1991, he was actually... Uh, going to be given entrance into the National Academy of Sciences, which is a prestigious organization of serious academics where they recognize you for your academic contributions. And he was not allowed in. Um, he was like basically blackballed in the first round of voting. Uh, and it led to this full debate. Um, and he secured less than a 50% yes vote in the final round. And he needed two thirds to get in. And he also did not get tenure at Harvard. And a lot of people couldn't figure out why, because when you actually look at his scientific contributions, aside from his science communication in the public eye, and it's been actually empirically validated and published on this, there's been multiple publications and there still are. So one that I think is really worth reading that is relatively contemporary is titled has contemporary academia outgrown the Carl Sagan effect? And that was published in February 2016. So in the social media age, not the modern, most modern social media age, but it's still being talked about. That's still being cited. And papers in the late 90s, all the way through the mid-2000s, th mid pointed out that Carl Sagan's academic outputs and the level of where they were cited, the impact they had, and all the things that you would evaluate someone who is going to be a, a tenure-track professor and entered into the National Academy of Sciences, he met or exceeded those but he was, not, he was not entered, uh, or he's not, he, was, he was denied entry. And there is this consistent issue that has been documented, and there are multiple peer-reviewed papers on it now on what's termed the Sagan effect, which is that in the scientific community, when you become visible and when you put a lot of, a lot of effort out into being in the public eye, your colleagues view you as a, not a real scientist. And I think we see that in the, in the fitness space. I don't think it's just as simple as necessarily jealousy. There's been qualitative interviews of people who kind of hold these views and have the skepticism. And a lot of the times the questioning of their motivations, what are you, why are you doing this? Why are you trying to be seen out front? And I think this made a lot of sense up until the social media age. And, and now it's actually quite interesting to where if you have a large social media pl platform, you will get more citations. You, are, you, you can impact the impact of journals by the fact that you're publishing there and your name is well known and you'll drive readership. So within academia, there's this mixed view of these public scientists. And I think while it didn't really make a whole lot of sense back in the day and it was just more about stuffy academia, now there's unfortunately sometimes truth to this. And a great example would be Huberman, you know, who is someone who is, as, a, like a, as of late especially, been putting out some really controversial takes that are not evidence-based, extending far beyond his own expertise. You know, he's not an astrophysicist talking about the origin of the cosmos. He's a neuroscientist telling you that, or platforming at least, people who are suggesting that fluoride in, in, in putting the water is, is going to be dangerous, or that we need to distrust you know, modern immunology and the use of vaccines and things like that. And, and we have to question like, well, why is he doing this? And in the modern social media age, it's not even that you're using marketing to promote, say, a book 
like was the concern in the 90s or the 2000s. If you read some of these interviews of why do academics not like these public facing people? It's like, well, are they really trying to educate the public or do they just want to sell a diet book? And that's a legitimate concern because the whole reason why I think there's value in what you're saying, Pac, and trying to de-emphasize the, the importance or the prestige of having a doctorate there is a prestige of having a doctorate or a medical uh, doctorate degree because some of the most negative impacts we've seen in the fitness industry have been from people with the trustworthy title of doctor, you know, putting out a diet book that is clearly a cash grab and they're smart enough and can communicate quote unquote science effectively enough that they can put out misinformation or disinformation that serves their purposes and they are actually leveraging their expertise, which creates this distrust. So, you know, your, your, your ketogenic diet, heavy push for, for cash grab by some MD or the Huberman podcast that's, you know, making millions of dollars off of ad revenue. And they're just noticing what gets clicks, what gets engagement is, is a changing space. I think it used to be, let me get a platform and I can sell you something pretty easy, you know, bait and switch. But now the platform itself is, is what is making money. Like if you have multi-million number of followers on a podcast and you have an ad, it doesn't matter. You don't have to sell anything. You just need to get people to listen to the podcast because the advertisers will come to you and pay you big bucks just to have stuff sold in there. You don't really care about that. It's about the ad revenue. But the, the advertisers are coming to you because you have millions of listeners. And you have millions of listeners because you're willing to do what gets you millions of listeners or what gets you millions of YouTube watchers or gets you, you know, millions of followers, which is simply be controversial for its own sake, which I think is kind of scary and it's quite different. And now we're in a place where there are many public quote unquote science communicators who are actually doing this for poor reasons. And it makes it very challenging for someone who's trying to do it for the right reasons. Now, this is obviously not the way all of ac the way academia sees things. Like, for example, we got a new dean here at AUT. And for those who don't know, like, yes, I'm on this podcast and all that, but I am actually a senior research fellow at Auckland University of Technology. I am an educator. I guest lecture at courses, and I have anywhere between five to, to nine PhD or master's students on a regular basis. I contribute to courses. I attend meetings. I host our, our personal development forums. I'm an active academic participating in this space because it's, it's a great university and we're trying to do good things. And here's an example of how it's not always like this. So we had a new dean. He came to uh, our research institute's lunch, and I introduced myself to him, and I started talking about my research. I made some joke about how I'm just a muscle nerd. And he was like, oh, that's great. Thank you so much for the work you do. And yeah, I'm like, oh, no, it's, it's my pleasure. And then the head of school said, oh, also, you should tell him about last year. And I was like, oh, wh what are you referring to? He said, oh, you're, you're, you're a pro card win. And I, so that, I, did, I didn't expect that. You've got a, a senior academic you know, the head of, head of school telling the dean that the, the, the thing you need to know about this guy is that he's, he's a professional at getting naked, right? You know, so it's, it's definitely outside of what is the typical stuffy academic thing. Looking she good was, while naked. Exactly. Well, looking great. Give a shout out to Dr. Dr. Brad Schoenfeld, you know? So it's, you know, there, there are definitely other academic environments where I would feel like I need to, 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 to hide that or, or not promote it. And I've met others who have, but I've, I've talked to a lot of people who maybe out of partially out of jealousy or just partly out of like, well, where do you have the time to do all this social media work? You're clearly, it's taking away from your time to put out, you know, academic resources and, and publish papers. And you know, the funny thing is that's been evaluated too. You know, there has been empirical research on people who have more social media engagement who are full-time professors versus those who have less. And on average, they produce slightly more publications that have slightly more engagement than those who don't. Because if you put out good work and you're being contracted or contacted and asked to be in media or you have more to talk about, again, this is on average. There's, of course, exceptions. Like I, I pointed out Huberman first <laughs> to say, like, yeah, there, there is some, some bad actors. But the typical person who is putting in the time on social media is doing that in addition to having a very active... Uh, or academic career. And the fact that they're getting, you know, shots fired at them in the academic community, if they're trying to maintain and hold a position in academia, I'm very careful about this. Um, but I also have a mission of educating everyone. And I've also positioned myself so I'm not beholden to academia. 
but some are. Some people are professors first and they do all this additional work to put out information and they're not necessarily being seen by their colleagues in always a fair or favorable light. And now we're seeing that to play the modern game of science communication, you have to play the social media game. You have to, you have to play the clickbait game. And now you're actually getting shots from people who feel like you're not, you're not doing that right. And, uh, and I get it because sometimes I look at some of the contents that's put out there and I go, nah, that's, that's not enough nuance. It's too clickbaity. That's too black and white. And I have, you know, I've gotten into it with people, even publicly in some cases where I disagree with the way they're communicating science. So as a science communicator, you not only have to juggle the potential backlash you get from the academic community, but also to your fellow science communicators and to the people who are, are consuming your information or, and, and they're like either anti-science and they're treating you as though you're a bad actor in all cases. And it's very challenging. So this is the woe is me as a science communicator episode. That's what I want to get acro across, that I am very oppressed. My life is very challenging. But no, in all seriousness, I think it is, it's very hard right now when the changing space of social media um, to figure out how to do this whole science communication thing because it's compounded upon all the things that already existed before social media even was there, like the Sagan effect. Yeah, sorry. Like that was, that was extremely, extremely insightful and very well said. Um, and what the frustrating thing is that people will judge academics who choose to be more out there simply on the fact that they're more out there, not that they're, they've sold out and now they're Huber manning it and Dr. Pack here is now talking about whatever stuff that you shouldn't, you shouldn't be talking about and has no idea or no, like no right to, to talk about in an absolute sense or whatever. Like it, it's frowned upon to, ah, you're an influencer now. Yeah. You have a following on Instagram. Uh, oh, you, you make memes. Oh, you make YouTube videos. And it's like, judge the content. Let's judge the message that's being spread, not the act of being on social media. And to your point, like people also like the, the couch, the, the couch criticism, like sitting on your couch and criticizing somebody um, who's making videos and, and memes and posts, like those, those things take resources, time, and they're essentially free for the consumer to, to consume. Um, and especially for individuals like yourself, an active researcher who has published a lot of a lot of uh, like important work for our field and has been part of many like big papers. No, I'm not just saying it. Plus, behind the scenes has helped a lot of us behind the scenes um, with our own PhDs and our own research. Like, there's no financial incentive there. And if you wanted to, you are a pro bodybuilder. You got the physique. You've power lifted. You have public. Even if you've published three papers. As long as you, you know you have a PhD, you can be out there fully selling out and making a lot more money. Um, and it's, it's just it's just mind boggling that people will still have so much um, adopt this this stance of hate towards people that haven't actually done much wrong. Um, you know, I often see people being very passionate against Brad Schoenfeld. You, yeah. If you and okay, like you may disagree with uh, that that one paper from back in the day, that the conclusion, whatever, that's part of the game, that's part of science. But it's like you are literally hating on people who are doing, and I, this will sound sound weird, but they're doing a uh, you know a, a societal a societal good on average, right? Like you can't be co correct all the time, and not all your takes are going to be a hundred percent. But putting everybody in the same basket and calling people social media PhDs and criticizing people for making video content while the same people also participate in the research and have those nuanced discussions and, and try to promote, you know, we did an episode here on open science with, with, with James Steele. And I don't know, it's, it's just a bit upsetting. It's, it shouldn't detract from, from our mission, but it's still a bit discouraging, not for myself. I don't really care, but I can see for, you know, for other people out there that they, they may be like, ah, maybe I shouldn't do the memes because uh, my professors are going to think less of me or I'll go to the whatever conference and people are going to look at me funny because I've also posted myself flexing naked on social media or a funny picture with my cat or whatever. So, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a weird space. Omar, I, I want to hear a lot of what you have to say on this, but I want to say one thing and I want to be really uh, clear about it. Um, 
I am probably one of the least criticized people in our space who does the science communication thing, who has the level of followers I have, which is moderate. You know, it's, it's not huge. Uh, it's certainly not small. Um, I'm obviously like a Jeff Nippert or a Jeremy Etier or the, the RP channel right now, tenfold, you know, kind of size plus of the reach I have. Right. Um, but of course there's tons of people who have one tenth of what I have. I'm the least criticized, not because I'm the best or I found the perfect balance, but because I'm conservative and I have, I have basically prevented my own growth in many ways because of my unwillingness to even get some potential criticism. Um, and anyone who's looking to me as, Hey, he's doing it right. I think this is what really needs to be said. If I adopted the strategy that I have gotten to, that has gotten me to here, if I adopted it today, I would be a lost voice in a sea of other people trying to do it. I'm a beneficiary of the fact that I was one of the early people coming out in a time where the game was less harsh, less complex. And I happen to have the luck of coaching someone like a Matt Ogus, of, of coaching someone like a Jeff Nippard, of coaching someone like a Bryce Lewis, of being asked later in my career to have the right time when those start to fall down, like having the privilege of having coached Jessica Bittner for, 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 for a couple of her, her seasons. And also being, once I'm in front of the camera, being really good. Like I'm not going dis to discount my own skill set, but I have not done the promotional work that's necessary today to be big, to grow, to do all those things. And I think I'm smart enough to figure out what those things are. I can identify them. Um, and, but I am conservative to the point of probably harming my own growth. So when people look to me, it's like, oh, but, but I'll, good old, you know, like Eric Helms, he does it right. And see, no one criticizes him. It's like, guess what? This is, I, I am, if you were to, to use me as a model, you're not going to make it in the field right now. And I think that's, I think that's really important to understand because it's easy for someone in my position, if I wasn't aware of that, to, you know, criticize and throw stones and, and not go, well, bro, you got to a hundred thousand followers five years ago. You know, you, you can rest on your, like you, you can not play the game a little bit because you've, you've already gotten out of the rat race. And I think it's a different thing to criticize someone who is trying to figure out how to make it as a content creator and still do good, not just to, to make it, but I mean, I mean, I'm talking about be able to pay your mortgage or your rent, not like be balling. You know what I'm saying? Just like the average, and you're going to talk about this more, so I won't steal your thunder, but the average person in the fitness space as a profession is, is not, has not yet made it, you know, it isn't, this isn't like, oh, I got a good office job. I got my RD credential and now I work at the hospital or whatever. This is okay. I'm, I'm going to try to create a fitness business. What do I do? I got to be here, there, this, I got to look good. I got to have at least a master's. I got to have a thing. I got to have a catchy name. I got to be on YouTube. I got to be on Instagram. Is TikTok, is that going to get banned? I hope it gets banned just so I don't have to worry about that additional platform. Like it's not a fair space right now. 100% exactly what you said and for those that don't know 100k followers on instagram schmistagram means absolutely like if you're not monetizing it properly like instagram specifically it's one of those platforms in two years could be completely obsolete like unless you're a big time youtuber and like please please don't say that please don't say that i i can't i, I got nowhere else to go well, I got nowhere else to go, Pack. You, you got the 3DMJ uh, channel as well, 100K subs. And you oh. got the plaque as well. Saw that. Respect. I tell you what, the growth rate on the 3DMJ YouTube channel, we were we were at, we were so far behind 100K five years ago. We were at 98,000. So this this organic growth is is crazy over the last five years. But it's it's I just want to highlight because people see the following and they see the quote unquote fame. And obviously, like if you, if you show up at Sheffield, people will come up to you. They will shake your hand. They will say good thing. But that doesn't pay the bills. Like you ain't getting, you ain't getting no direct. Like you're not getting a lot of money, or if any money, there's no sponsorships coming to to us. Coaching inquiries, sure, rascal. Yeah, you can get you know high heist the the, the <laughs> heist Omar's headquarters for 300 free T-shirts. But like even Omar, nearly a million subscribers, ha focused for a couple of years on rascal, and obviously that grew a very successful business. But YouTube was like, okay, bro, peace. We'll see you some other time. We don't care about you anymore. No offense. You, you yeah. get how I mean it, right? Yeah. No, I, there, 
there's a lot to be said about this. And why am I going to be the positive one now? Because we'll go on, uh, Jens, for like at least I'm, I'm down for at least another 30 minutes because this is a, this is a very important topic. Um, to your point, let's frame it that way, uh, Pac. So we each have our own financial need, let's say. I really, really enjoyed my time where YouTube was the primary focus. The channel was successful. It was very viable um, over a period, I'd say, from 2009. That's when I started. But when I started taking off was 2012. That took three years. That's a hint for a future point I want to make. Uh, but between 2012 and 20, uh, uh, 2020, there was over 100 some million views. The channel in its totality has almost 200 million views, which means that every single month consistently from 2013 to 2020, it was between two to three million views per month. Um, and, and so that it, it was by far one of the larger channels to give some context, our boy, we just said, Sam Sulik at his peak, he had 18 million views in October. Now he's at down to 10 million, uh, because it is, it's like, it's a phenomenon, right? Like we'll see which way it goes, but even still, because everyone, like I said before, and I like what you mentioned, Eric, about viability is that everyone has a different uh, level of financial need. There wasn't any problem with doing the YouTube but being inside that system, you obviously have to constantly either reinvent yourself in a good way because the the level of content continuously escalates. And that's a good thing, right? Because as the audience grows and as they deepen, they've been watching for a long period of time, the expectations uh, as such will also grow. And that that's a good thing. But anyways, uh, Rascal, it did well. I wanted to focus on that. I had other goals. But taking now a look back, Taking a look at the last few years, a hot take. I have a, a few hot takes, uh, Eric. The first is that if Galileo just played the thumbnail game a little bit better, he wouldn't have been imprisoned. Instead of saying, yo, Earth is in the center of the universe, God, you know what I'm saying? The sun is. Instead, I mean, you know, like just just, just re rearrange it a little bit, right? Uh, just massage it. He would have been all right. So it really was his fault. But I will say that I almost want, uh, I want to see Eric Unchained. Hashtag Eric Unchained in the comment section, because I think, and this is me being positive, but being truthful, I think you can absolutely, if that was your goal, Eric, and that's the big, that's the big caveat here. Okay. Well, I'm going to talk specifically to you. And then I want to talk like the general space and like how I think a lot of the conversation, what Pac said by uh, fellow peers or whatnot, they're self-limiting to the greater good of the space. And that's the larger point. But man, Eric, I think you wouldn't have to compromise on any single one of your morals or your integrity whatsoever in order to grow. I think it's 100% possible. I think there are various ways to grow that would involve compromising those things. I think the part that got me, and you mentioned it, it was perfectly said, man, where you have, let's say, your peers, like both of yours, uh, peers that are critical people that attempt to do the science communication thing. Well, Eric, you just listed all the other responsibilities that you have. Basically, yes, it is beneficial to both of you to participate in the space for your career, but it is not the main thing, meaning that if social media just blew up, you know, uh, Eric, you could get along with your life, Pac, you could get on with your life. It would change what you do, but it's an aspect, it's not the totality. So you're not, we need to talk about specialist classes, right? You're not a YouTuber, you're not a uh, of a primary purpose, a purpose as social media person, okay. My question for the people that criticize any entrant into the space, so let's say anyone with like a, you know, bachelor's, master's, PhD, doesn't really matter, but someone that wants to get into science communication, I'm like, how do you expect these people to become really good at the job when, as you just said, Eric, you have a full-time commit, full-time commit, coaching, this, right, PhD, like you just, you listed off a whole bunch of things. And then on the side, you're trying to do the content game. And yet all these people, they're like, well, wait, wait, like you shouldn't even try to do that. Well, let me tell you this. You need to try and you need to make mistakes. And those two are not one and the same. Being a fantastic researcher is not the same as being a fantastic content producer. You need the years, you need the mileage, you need the hours and hours of experience. So what do people expect on the outside? Let's say those peers or both of your contemporaries, if someone wants to get good, you're going to be making mistakes. The first time you did a research paper, or not first time, first several times, I'm sure there's you know some nominal mistakes that were made, they're later rectified, right? It's a learning experience. You need to participate though in the space in order to become better. So I find it, Eric, intensely bizarre, those that gatekeep, and I under, I understand the other perspective, let's say, of like, oh, there wasn't enough nuance. Like, man, Eric, you're a PhD, you're talking nutrition, you were there on that five-minute YouTube video, ah, oh, like what he really should have said, of, of course, okay, like there, there always is that high expectation, and I think that it's simply not fair if you cannot provide 
another viable alternative or series of viable alternatives in the space. And so if you are critiquing other people, completely fair, right? We're all having this conversation, but at least tell me or tell us or tell someone else right now, hey, here's like five or six people that are really doing it right, but not only really doing it right, they're viable at doing it. Because as you said, Eric, like, man, think about yourself. You'd even mention your personal commitments, right? Like, let's say to your wife, to your mom, to your friends. Like, so like you're, you're a, a full, a fully 3D human being trying to do all these things. And now let's say Eric wants to go all the way into doing this. He wants to dedicate five more hours. He tries to summarize things and wait, wait a second. Oh, someone's going to now criticize. Oh, Eric, it wasn't nuanced enough for that editing like that. That's kind of cheesy or whatever. It's like you need to get the reps in because these are two completely different skill sets. And to give an example, um, years ago, to your point, not you, Eric, uh, I think you have evolved with the space. But like just for people, it's it's the easiest thing to be, you know, armchair critic to sit back and say, that's not how I would do it or that's not how it should be done. As you said, it's far easier to identify a problem than providing a solution. But right now, what we need are those solutions. Because here are some raw facts. There are more people interested in fitness content than ever before. Whether it is TikTok, whether it's Instagram, whether it's YouTube, whether it's YouTube Shorts, more than ever before. I would say the impact by science communicators is still significant. Uh, it'd be hard to measure this, evaluate like what the total impact is, but I think it could certainly be better or more. And that, that would only be a good thing as a public good. Okay. Uh, but if we take a look at a decade ago and we take a look at the expectations where some people would say now, like, Oh, remember the good old days, uh, Eric, where we could just get on, talk 20 minutes about like sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, no cuts whatsoever. And people would just listen. I'm like, well, that's not the same. If you take a look at sitcoms from the 1960s versus now, like the, the number of jokes per minute, there is such a thing when you participate in the community within a culture, it's ever evolving. And so a decade ago, there was a PhD scarcity where it was simply enough to have a PhD to contribute some sort of value to someone that had a YouTube channel, to your point, Eric, uh, uh, there was that scarcity. So as an example, like a decade ago, whatever, I'm making this up, but in some parallel field, let's say you need a translation on like ancient Sumerian text and you find this one linguist. How do they do? They do like a pretty good job. It's like, are they accurate in terms of translating it? Are they engaging? Maybe, maybe not. But like we got the person and this is rarefied. But the expectations grow over time. And so my question, and I want to leave it there because there, there's much more to be said. What is the viable alternative for those that will critique someone like a, I don't know, like a pack getting in the space, a Milo, if Eric wanted to get more in the space, if they need to get the reps in, but you're basically critiquing them along the process, not in a way like, hey, man, like, hey, pack, whatever, like that meme, it was good. I thought I'm making this up once again. I thought it was a little too edgy. Maybe you could have done A, B, C, D. Like, is this actually helpfully building a skill set that other people can share, utilize, learn, pass on, and then evolve with the space? Or are we basically just gatekeeping every single person that wants to be a communicator so that no more people are leveling up their skills? And Eric, as time goes on, it used to be a level three or whatever with those ancient Sumerian texts. Now we're level 65. And meanwhile, everyone that wants to get started in science communication, they're starting at a three or four. And as soon as they try and go to a 10, oh, no, 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 you shouldn't do that. And this is the last, I'd say, admission, man. Every single person that produces con uh, content has that internal conversation, that internal compass, which of course is necessary. Is this too far? Is this not enough? And so it's a constant battle. And if you're not kind of flirting, not with the line, but having that conversation, then I think you're probably not doing enough to even say like, hmm, like, what do I think about this? But unnecessarily gatekeeping, I think is absolutely the enemy of developing eventually effective communication and reaching the intended audience. I totally agree. That's really well said. Really nice. But, and what, all, what also people miss is like, guys, we are an applied field. Like there's many people out there that will benefit from the simple practical takeaway from the Eric Helms who has done all the reading and has been involved. A thousand writing podcasts. Writing up the manuscript, a thousand podcasts, done the RCTs, done the reviews. Yes. It, doing the 45 minute video where I will watch it and I'll be like, Oh, that's really cool. The nuance and that other paper. But you know, if Eric decides to do the th one minute reel going over why, you know, a big surplus may not be necessary. Does he need to review all the literature and go over every possible mechanism? He can throw a disclaimer and say, Hey, we need more research, but it's likely that if you do this and that, you know, you're probably going to get closer to your destination. It's, it's tough. Um, and you, you're getting 
getting critiqued and gatekeeped is actually someone else's content too. You yeah. know? Boom. Right. And that's easier so content. Like, Reactionary content always does better just in general on any social media platform because it's controversial. Absolutely. Yeah. You not doing your job the way someone else thinks you should have is their easy content. They take the uh, an uncharitable view, uh, easy dunk on the new PhD, um, you know, put it out there. You disguise it as an educational post about, you know, how you should be doing things, but it's really, it's, it's, it's a hit piece. And why is it effective? Because again, what is rewarded right now is things that get eyeballs. It's what grabs attention. So controversy, uh, drama. And if you can wrap up controversy and drama into, you know, groupthink and, 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 commu and communication and education, hey, it works, you know? Is it ethical? Many times not, um, but you know that doesn't seem to be the concern of some people. So it's it's um, it's not an easy place to be in, and I am privileged that I can draw the line in the sand in a far more conservative place than other people, um, and use what I've already built and be on other people's channels and use my I wouldn't say my clout, maybe my credibility to get clout. But I think other people, they don't have credibility yet. They have the credentials that if they were platformed could get them credibility or the skill set that if platformed could get them credibility and they're clawing tooth and nail to get the clout, to then have it. And that drive to get the clout, which is unfortunately a necessary part of your resume to be successful in the modern age and content game, makes people like it has some people detract from your credibility. So I think it is a difficult trap. Um, and I don't think there's no way out of it, but I do think that each person needs to be asking, where do I draw the line in the sand? And I say sand because then you can wipe it off and draw it somewhere else because you will need to. Even if you, you know, reevaluate your, your, your compass of, okay, what's my target audience? What level of nuance do I need? Okay, I've taken on board legitimate feedbacks when messaging me, not just, you know, making a meme out of me for their own content. Um, and then making, you know, another attempt to go from level four to level five on my content. Um, yeah, you're going to have to draw that line in the sand somewhere else. And it's a lot of ways to do it. It's a lot of different platforms. And you can have a general audience. Or I think like me, it's something that I've come to accept and what I think I'm doing is I try to educate other educators in many cases, or people who are just like real deep in this. Um, and, and that's okay. You know, it's, it, it is going to throttle my, my growth a little bit, but at the same time, like, okay, let, let's just talk brass tacks. If my income is from selling a book that has 200 references or a research review, the general person who's like, oh, how do I get bigger biceps? Isn't like, oh, well, cool. I need, I need to, I need to understand every publication on on EMG of bicep curls that comes out every month for the next six years. They're, that's not who's going to purchase it, but the person who might want to communicate to that general audience who wants to get it right will. So there is more than one way to do this. And there are some ways which are viable. There's some ways which are not, but you have to be able to figure that out. And you can't figure that out purely from analysis, you know, um, because by the time someone analyzes the current social media trends and algorithms and figures it out, it's changed. That's true. And it's, it's like the behind the scenes is not pretty like content, the creation the you gotta write scripts, you gotta pay for the videos, pay the editors, buy equipment, potentially learn. Like I was blessed to have Milo by my side who, you know, spent tens of thousands of at the home studio for all the lights and a ton of details, spoke to cinematographers, did all that setup, like obviously scripting because uh, i'll speak for, i'll speak for Milo now scripting he does four videos a week uh releases four videos a week those have to be ahead of schedule the guy has another full-time job coaches not full-time anymore but near full-time and it's like the, the behind the scenes is not pretty and it doesn't reward you immediately it's an investment that may or may not pay off depending on the on where you take your career and what what path you you choose to take so that's that's also like people than to see things from the outside and assume that it's all a dandy behind the scenes. And it's like, oh, following, they, they, they get likes. And it's like, th those likes are, if anything, they're more, sometimes more anxiety inducing because you're like, okay, this seems to be 
somewhat working. Uh, it's not paying yet. Why is it not paying yet? How can I get it to pay? And at what point can I take a step back and not right. be releasing videos and going the extra mile on literally everything? You know, a venting session with Aaron Culture. No, but I, I do think both of what you said is extremely valuable. I do think the silver lining, uh, kind of as we're discussing, I think fitness is inherently appealing, right? Like most people have some sort of fitness goal. So people are open-minded in terms of receiving that information. And now with shorter form content, I think, so to bring up Milo for a second, respect to him, respect to the investment. What a lot of people don't realize, Milo, it, uh, he has a channel that is growing. I think he's at like 20K subs. So inside of like the first six months, that's very good. He has spent he has spent way more money in terms of production, all the things that are necessary, I think, to eventually scale up to where he would like to be. And that is an investment that may or may not pay off. But he is currently losing. We joke about Iron Culture, like what we do, we don't have any sponsors, but it's a joke, like it's a it's a it's a certain amount, like for the editing, it's no problem whatsoever for us. But if you want to get into serious content creation before it becomes viable, and we keep using that word, you're probably going to put a lot of investment financial investment, time investment that could be otherwise utilized, you know, elsewhere. I will say the silver lining is that, and that's why I do think uh, folks like yourself, Pat, uh, Pac and uh, Milo, growing up in the culture, so to speak, learning to speak the language can give you a differential advantage over someone who is just in the so-called ivory tower that hasn't learned to communicate with the average, if that is what your goal is. Um, and there are platforms like, I would say, TikTok, where you know we, we joke about it often. But like, if you understand the way to communicate on there, it is the most low cost way. And the editing is actually fairly simple. And I don't think anyone would have to make a compromise um, in order to grow there. And to your point, Eric, about timing being, you know, as with uh, everything, very important in life. Um, if someone was an astute observer and saw like TikTok, which wasn't hard to see, like trending circa 2020, and you're one of the first entrants on there, and you had a presence, you would have grown more rapidly. And as you continue to participate, you would have become more savvy in terms of what you need to do on so on and so forth. So I don't think it's like this impossible battle for any anyone wanting to get in. And I don't want that, obviously, for any of us to be um, the message. I don't think it is. But I do think content creation is a certain, it's a skill set there's a wide variety of different skill sets in terms of how you determine what your content is. Uh, to Eric's point, I think a lot of the concessions one has to make in order to become popular, well, then that might create a moral dilemma, but it's not necessary. That, let's say if there's like 30 different ways, maybe 20 of them are kind of shitty, but there's you know 10 that are uh, uh, ways that people would be comfortable with, but it, it comes at the cost of learning, learning the platform, learning the system, learning how to communicate. So it's like, let's talk about quality content. You have to know the topic. You have to know the audience, what you just said, Eric, where it's like, you need to figure out what your audience is, man. Are you going to be a general uh, 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 communicator? Like, are you going to be someone for a general audience? Or are you going to be more specialized, right? Are you going to attempt to educate professionals? Do you understand the way they think? Do you understand the content they want to see? And so I think like quality content is actually fairly involved and there's nothing better than getting reps in just like, you know, reps in the gym, it doesn't really matter. And that's why my fundamental question about people gatekeeping, those just trying to get in the space, how do you expect them to get better at it? Or not even better, but how do you expect them to get to the level that you personally perceive to your own personal standard that may or may not be uh, realistic, but also just reach a larger audience? Because to me, and I put this forth, I don't know if you guys would agree, the bigger issue right now is not having enough people making a sizable impact. I do think the current space is almost the beneficiary of an infrastructure that was established by prior work of such as a as an example, like 10 years ago, having that PhD that'll get you in the door. You're brought on a channel, like it, you know, it, it's a reciprocal relationship. And now because people are like, cool, I know that, or or whatever, most people maybe there is that uh a bit of that in our space of anti-intellectualism coming in. There, there's a barrier. There's an increased barrier that may not have been there like eight years ago. And we're really going to try and limit the people just trying to do the damn thing saying, hey, you're not doing it correctly without telling them, hey, here's how you do it. I really do think it's possible if people are willing to try. But I think uh, amongst the community, maybe we just have to be a little bit more open or have uh, better good faith conversations, right? With each other, as opposed to you said, Eric, which I like, this is like, man, 
uh, response content. Like I have no problem saying this about a guy like, like a, a Greg Doucette. Like you mentioned Milo making four videos a week. Man, a script, those videos take time. He's thinking about the audit. He's thinking like, what do I have to leave on the, you know, the cutting room floor? Like I have, I want to make an eight minute video of whatever we're joking, memes, length and partials. What goes in, what goes out? The amount that goes out is far more that goes in. How do I communicate all this information that's super valuable within eight minutes without losing or keeping as much nuance as possible? That's a skill right there. How do I say it in such a way that people are like, oh, this guy, the way he's presenting it to me, I want to listen to that individual. That's a whole other skill set. Then you talk about the thumbnail, the title, the sequence of like the videos that you're doing. So like the you're, you're now building out like kind of content for a year because if you're doing the same thing every single year, people are going to get jaded. They're going to turn off. They're not going to want to. Now, now you're trying to build basically a, a, like a not only on a platform, but a, a presence there. So I don't know. I find it interesting, man, sitting on the sidelines. I wish more people, more people, people in academia would try and communicate and would try and learn uh, uh, the ropes because I think you can only benefit uh, the greater community. It's a tough one. Uh, as an academic, I can say that it's it's more about the incentives. You know, um, I think you want to know why are all the academics on Twitter? Like, because it's kind of weird, right? It's, it limits your characters more than Instagram. Um, you know, you 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 can't put a, a video on there showing or talking. It's 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 it doesn't seem like a great platform to communicate science. Why are they on there? Because it's the lowest barrier to entry. You get on your phone, you type out 150 characters, you say, hey, here's what we found, and then that's it. You don't have to figure out an image to go with it. You don't have to edit a video. It's lazy. And so, okay, well, hold on. Academics aren't lazy. Why are they on there? Because they have no time, right? So Twitter literally became the place where science communication happens, even though it's the poorest place to communicate scientific nuance, because the people who are scientists communicating science don't have the time to do all the things that you've described because it's hard, mm -hmm. right? And then when you see, and, and of course, Twitter is not a great place to grow like a, a fitness following, you know, it's, it's more of like a general kind of following. So yeah, like it's Twitter is, is in, in the academic space is mostly just academics yelling at each other about things and arguing over, over these things. It's kind of like this weird little growth that doesn't match the rest of the platform. And when I have talked to some of my colleagues about social media, they're like, oh, how are you doing on Twitter? I'm like, I don't even have a Twitter. And they, they look at me like I have two heads. But you got threads right? though. Oh, that's, this is true. The fastest stagnating growth of any, of any new platform. I jumped on that one early, early adopter. Follow me on there. 26.5 thousand. That was yesterday. It could be 26.51 today. At least you don't you even know. Eric. Let's put, at least you hopped on though, bro. I'm proud of you because I, I do think if hey, it, hey, my content's gold on there. Let me tell you what. Helm's thoughts. That that's where you want to go. Gotta go Helm's um, deep, but go on. Yeah, you got brand that. I tried. Yeah. Time. But the the so I, I when I talk to academics or like around me and I'm telling them about like, well, listen, like for fitness, people are interested in changing the way they move or the way they look, you know, or or what they can do. It's visual. Like, so you need to do like here's what I'm doing. And this isn't even that effective. And they look at it and they go, oh man, that's way too much commitment, you know? And, and like I said, I'm someone who's not engaged enough. <laughs> like I, I'm the losing strategy for the modern fitness content evidence-based producer. And what I'm doing is is far too too challenging for my my contemporary academic friends. You know what I'm saying? So it's, um, I think it is, it's tough, but I will say that there is a movement towards research impact, quote unquote, uh, as far as the incentive structure in academia, which is more about how does your research, especially in fields related to people, applied translational research, how does it impact policy change? How does it impact the consumer? How does it impact people? And I think that's a good thing for fields like exercise science, because then like, for example, I went up for, from research fellow to senior research fellow and I was promoted. I put the growth of my social media platforms in that application and it was positively viewed. And if you were to read that paper that I cited earlier about the, the Sagan effect, you know, there were, they, they cited a interview with a 2011, um, guy who won an academic award. And he specifically said, you know, when you have these meetings, like de-emphasize aspects of your, of your self-promotion. Yep. So that is changing in some spaces. 
Um, I was viewed favorably, not just because I have a, a pretty good citation, you know, uh, record and I've published a lot. 25. It's yeah. Like it's pretty good, but people are also recognizing that. Um, and also for the fact that I'm only on like a part-time role, uh, you know, with them and I've only been, you know, in academia since 2017, really like as a post PhD. So my outputs are, are, are quite high, uh, compared to my, my colleagues, um, I don't mean that to, to sound arrogant or to, to disparage them, but some of that is actually driven by the fact that I am on social media, which has changed. Like, I think it was previously viewed as science communication is, it's great, it's fine, it's okay, but it takes away from actually doing the science. But now people are seeing that science communication, being on social media, is what is getting you more reads. It's what's making the research have a larger impact. And because that's being acknowledged, I do think there's going to be incentive and reward, reward structures that actually do encourage more social media engagement and maybe even give people, hey, you've got a full-time contract. Friday is your your social media day. We're not far away from that. And I think that's that's ultimately a good thing um, because anyone who you see, like a great example, you know, is, is Bill Campbell. He's got a lab. He's a full-time professor and he's very active on his social media and he does things outside of it. Um, and he's managing to do that as someone who is older than me and more embedded in academia than me, but pretty successful and probably not to the same level of growth. Because again, it's just a, a, like a resource calculation. Like how much time do I have to give to these things and how quickly can I learn this and what can I do? So, um, yeah. So anyway, I guess my point is, is that there, there is silver linings. There is push to do this. And I think it's going to get better within academia and within the university structure. But now we're facing these new struggles of other people in the space, like content creators who are not necessarily academics going like either these, these, these lab coast scientists don't know anything, right? They're, they're just these, these exercise scientists. And we've talked about this ad nauseum. I'm not going to get back into that whole thing or like you're, you, you're, you're, you're not doing it right. Like I'm going to police your level of, 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 of nuance, you know? So it's, the safe thing to do is, is to have too much nuance and not grow, but be out there. And I think like you said, Omar, the problem is, is then you're not actually making good content that changes things. So it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's a difficult set of, of barriers to, to overcome and to figure out which concessions you make and where do you compromise and who is your audience. But I think the purpose of this podcast is to just to simply identify the problem and sneak peek of a couple episodes from now, I think talking to some of the people who are trying to make it in this space, um, like yourself, Pac, um, and are coming up and trying to figure out where to draw that line of the sand, learning, and who have probably a better intuitive grasp of what needs to be done than someone who's turning 41 next month like myself, I think will be a really good companion to this episode. So watch this space. Make sure you tune into Iron Culture because we're going to keep talking about this because, hey, I know there's a lot of listeners who are considering going this route, either, I mean, you don't have to necessarily even get a master's or, or a PhD. You might just be a trader who is invested in your education, is or is not going to get a bachelor's, but also wants to educate people because it's your passion. So there's a, like, you can't really exist in this space and not consider this, honestly. Um, you know, unless you're one of the people who just has a great location, goes to the a popular gym and you're a full-time trainer, you don't do any online stuff, but that's becoming rarer and rarer. 100%. Closing no, thoughts, my um, friend. Closing thoughts, exactly what 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 uh, what Eric said, and that's I, I feel that the the more self-employed sort of not full-on entrepreneur, but the more self-employed route um, is going to be a route that a lot of people will want to to take and become educators in, in the space, and you know, as online coaching and now training apps are gonna are gonna become a thing. And the, the the game is changing, and you can't don't hate the player, hate the game. At the end of the day, that's that's all I'm gonna say. But a lot of people, a lot of people will have, for one reason or another, will have to adapt and somewhat change their ways if they want to make it in that space. And that includes myself in 10, 15 years. In 10, 15 years, it may not be these sorts of videos and, and memes. It may be something else. And if I want to exist in the space the same way. I exist now. I will have to to adopt, to adapt and adopt new practices. But overall, I do want to highlight that 
I do feel that the space is in a good place for the consumer and for people that want to learn about science. Science is becoming more and more accessible. We have now preprints are becoming more accessible. There's been pushback there as well, which that's a whole different story. But I just want to say that, you know, things are looking good overall. And we do, we do, <laughs> we do tend to focus a lot on the negatives and we do tend to have these discussions on, you know, criticism and things that are going to be better. But I think overall, people collectively, everybody's doing well, even the people that, you know, will have the slightly hot take here and there. Overall, we're in a very good place. And lifters um, are getting, you know, are getting good information. They have access to free programs and things are solid. So I'll leave, I leave this with a positive note. Hey, Pack. I love to hear it, man. Um, and I will say, maybe I feel so positive because I'm not currently participating in the space. If I was, I'd be getting that uh, feedback. But in all seriousness, like a l this whole infrastructure that was built starting, I'd say like around a decade or so ago, you weren't getting any positive feedback. Like, damn, I'm talking about the science of A, B, C, D. These views are really trending up. It's time to keep doing it. It was born from passion, right? Or people wanting to get it right. And so I think just keeping that frame of reference or that mindset can become important as you continue to do something. And to your point, uh, Pac, what you said about like my like the idea that it's like an investment is it even financial. The financial is like the first consideration, like fulfillment, like all those other things are also considerations. I think we need to take these stabs. I think we need to take a, a shot at trying to do it. And it's interesting to me where I think some of the people that are most critical, what they don't understand is that it sounds counterintuitive, but by gatekeeping, they're preventing the outcome that they desire, meaning that in order to become in order to become bigger, usually, you have to become a better communicator, a better content producer which comes from participating in the game and failure to do so as the place evolves, I would say is disrespectful to the audience. So you need to get your reps in. You probably are going to make mistakes because guess what? It's a fluid environment, right? Like as Eric said about the thumbnails and titles not being as important before, now they're more important. Cool. Or like, let's say like the hook, the way that you hook in the first 15 seconds, you could take a look, look, uh, people are very interested in analytics. YouTube's fantastic. Well, they'll show you the drop off. Like you could watch your video and say, like, oh, like at this point or so on and so forth. So there might need to be a few concessions, but the benefit of learning and actually being a viable content producer over time is something then that you could pass on some of those lessons to other people, or that at least there's a proof of concept. If we're merely critiquing every single person and we're not giving any example of how it should be done, then that is by the very definition gatekeeping because you're saying, oh, like you're not doing it right. I'm like, okay, well, like who, like who is doing it right? And you can't provide a name for that. And that's why I think um, the final thing I'd say, hypothetically, once a hey, knock on wood, things were great. Shout out to PAC, uh, uh, Rascal Arnold uh, Expo. But like eventually, if I do get back into producing content, I come from an incredibly pr uh, privileged position now where I do not directly need to do any of the content in order to, you know, have my job, have the income that I had before. And so a lot of the people that you're seeing, and so I put myself now in this category where you have Pac, you have Milo, where it's like, you know, they want to eventually like the YouTube and the social media to grow so that they can derive some of their income from it. But it's like a big investment. So a lot of the people that you see that are doing the damn thing, it basically comes down to enjoyment. We're like love of the game. Plus, yes, there is a financial incentive, but that's so far down the line. And if it's purely about, you know, uh, making more money, there are far better alternatives to doing so. So you need to encourage people is what I'm saying. And so I love to see it personally. And that's why, once again, Eric, I'm joking with you. We're like, because I'm now on the outside looking in, it's all po uh, it's all positive to me. But I like to see uh, Pac participate. I like to see Milo participate. Hey, we're going to have eventually on the podcast Max Coleman. That's called Long Hair Bias. Um, we're going to roast him for his movie recommendations. But we want him to eventually participate in the space. I love to see it, man. I love to see it. So I, I do have uh, hope for the future. And I, I hope that those that... It's important to hold people accountable, but those that are maybe uh, too nitpicky with some of the things, they just reconsider why they're doing it in the first place, right? Are we helping the community? Are we at the service of the community or what's really going on? Yeah. Well said. Well said. And there's a lot of voices in my head. 
<laughs> good and bad. But no, there's a lot of voice. There's a voice in my head that says, "Bro, quit. You're making enough money. You don't need to. The, the YouTube is costing like a proper, like a, a monthly salary. Um, just quit. Just leave it. You're good. Uh, you can go in academia. You're building. You're doing research. There's job offers there. But like, as you said, it's 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 an investment and if, it's something that I believe will allow me in the future to do more good than if I was to say, okay, let's take a massive step back and look at just what makes sense in a, in a way, uh, financially, at least in the short term. And I encourage other people out there, instead of just criticizing, obviously it's good to give constructive feedback and all, all of us are going to make mistakes. And a lot of my content, I'm sure in five years, I'll look back and be like, what the hell was that? Like from, from many different, from like how I was talking, how I was scripting things. And that's, that's part of it. But I would encourage more people to try and participate, to relate to some of the struggles and also to relate to the difficulty of science communication and pleasing literally everyone, because there's no yeah. chance. Uh, yeah. You have to pick your battles and you can't be super, yeah. I don't know there's no chance. You can, you can. okay. I, but my, my soul needs to believe there is, because that's that's how I base my life and to my own detriment. So, yeah. Yeah. My, my schmick is, hey, everything and nothing matters. Science tells you, you know, you can be flexible. Just lift the damn weight. That's the schmick I'm going to take with the SBS world. Is, is that word allowed on this podcast? With the, with the SBS role, that's where I get to geek out and do a different type of content, thankfully. And that satisfies that side of me. And with the research as well, we get to be in the literature and you know, comment on each other's papers and discuss behind the scenes. But with the Dr. Pack brand, I can't have everything. It can't be 40-minute yeah. videos, research review, and then, you know, the jolly fatso telling you just lift. Like, it has to be one thing. Anyways, all that to say, thank you for tuning in at Iron Culture. I'll see us out. Eric, I will say one final closing piece. Um, after my three other final closing pieces and your guys' two final closing pieces. And this final closing piece is that it's totally fine to look back and be like, ah, like Pac said, like my content could have been better. I'll learn that. The only thing you don't want to look back on and have regret about is the why and, and the, the outcome. So have a mission statement. All this other stuff will change. The one thing that will not is like, like Omar said, know your audience and then know what you're trying to achieve. And if I was to sum up my mission statement in very simple terms, it's leave it better than I found it, right? And even if you do a really crappy job, if you're attempting to leave it better than you found it, you're going to look back and be like, well, that, that idiot was, it was a plucky, you know, like good guy doing his best. He was dumb. He did a, he did a poor job. Maybe there was some minor harm, but it comes across that you are attempting to make the space better. And I think a lot of people, they get so consumed by the game, they don't actually know why they're playing it. Eh? So just make sure you understand why you're playing the game. And yes, do hate the game, not the player. But know why you're playing the game and know, and know who you're playing the game for. That's all I got to say. Preach. Yeah. Come on, man. Yeah, this is, this is one of those episodes we're saying at the end. It's a monster episode. I can't tell you guys how many times, every single year that I was producing content, you could take a look back, be, oh, I should have done this, but every single year, the mistakes actually, like the actual mistakes in terms of conveying the information, the way those conveyed, but that is necessary. One must get messy in order to build masterpieces. And if that is the limiting barrier, where they go, oh, like I, I didn't do this right, or I can't do this right, you're never going to try and do it in the first place. And to Eric's point, everyone goes to that crucible eventually. And I think like, what washes out in the end will be kind of what your values were from the beginning or, or what they transformed into. And so you have to participate in it. And, and for some people, like that's why you see, hey, have a PhD, start selling something else, make some compromises, like this and that. Like so, sometimes people change and that's okay. You won't even really know yourself, in my personal opinion, until you start doing the damn thing. So really by that experiential knowledge, you find even more of yourself. And so I just want to see more people participating in whatever eric stay tuned so if they ban tiktok in america cool whatever there's going to be another platform there's going to be another platform though so guys just get ready and guess what 
YouTube being around. Bat them all, baby. <laughs> bat them all, yeah. Bat them all. Honestly, bat them all. It would be nice. Just three years. Totalitarian government, three years. No YouTube. I guess I don't need to shoot videos this month. <laughs> vote vote meta folks okay yep. just lock in instagram yep. i've i've made it there and that's all we need that's all that's it that's it it's wild that youtube's been around for 20 years because, because most of them i do think there'll be an alternative to instagram inside of like five instagram is basically a decade and a, a decades long um but anyways we'll see thank you so much for watching another episode listening oh back you want to say something Code Go. 3165 for those that listen until the end. Put it in the comments. This is a, a way. This is a little trick I do. Let's see who who's a real one. The real of real ones. <laughs> uh, I will say a shout out to Kai who's doing the timestamp. So might be the only person to leave a comment. Kai, we appreciate you. Thank you to every single listener of the Iron Culture. We're back every single uncertain day here from now until the end of time don't forget to leave a rating and review five stars is typically what people will give us we've learned recently not from any particular host but sometimes five stars just isn't enough and sometimes if it's 95 percent positive what does that mean you let down five percent of the people um so just think about that and think about the emotions of as a whole right as an aggregate the host of Iron Culture, how you'd make them feel. But go ahead, leave a rating review on Apple iTunes. We'll catch you in that next episode.